Ah. Boo. Right, okay, I'll try again. From the top. <laughs> hmm. Let's try, actually, uh, I'll swap mics. One second. This should work. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the chain. Uh, you alright? already arrived minutes ago, I'm sure. Uh, this is our series where one episode links to another by some means, whether that be the director, an actor, the composer, the word in the title, could be anything. This week, it's a word in the title. It's the title. Godzilla, um, our titular kaiju character. Last week, we had a look at Alexander Diplar's score from the 2014 adaptation. This week, we're having a look at David Arnold's uh, from 1998. An underrated score, I'd say. Um, possibly because of the way the movie wasn't hugely well received, um, mostly amongst Godzilla fans, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a great score. Um, and I actually still have a bit of a soft spot for the movie. So there we go, each to their own. Um, big orchestra, as you can see, um, and uh, s almost the same size string section as uh, last week. One desk fewer per string uh, section, um, otherwise pretty similar size orchestra. Big old brass section um, and some doubling in the woodwinds. For those of you who are interested, um, the cue numbering... Um, 14 M1 R1A, bit of a mouthful. It means real 14, music cue number one, revision number one, with an insert, which is the A. Um, this is the final cue from the movie, so that's kind of appropriate given that we had a look at the final cue from the 2014 adaptation last week. Um, do remember to come and say hi in the live chat if you are here during the live stream. And thank you to everyone who has already. Hi to uh, Chris and Michael. Uh, Funny ML, I'm really sorry, I can never remember what your first name is. Uh, Dimitri, Darren, and anyone else who's here, um, welcome. Uh, as you can see, I've already set up a template in Sibelius ready to go. Um, so we're gonna kick off and I was really, really tempted to do the opening uh, cue, um, which is actually what you heard as we played in. Um, however, um, this is orchestrated by Nicholas Dodd, and um, I've worked with his full score before when I published Independence Day, and this is very similar. It's got similar quirks and uh, in the way that he puts together his full score manuscripts. Um, so in some respects um, I know what to expect and how to interpret um, some of what he does which is a bit different than others um, but in other ways um, when it does get a bit unusual and complicated um, I have to kind of slow down and really concentrate on what I'm doing um, and I just fear that we wouldn't have made a great deal of progress on that first cue because when I was reading through there are a lot of things that really needed to be uh, thought about <laughs> should we say uh, whereas this last cue is a little bit more straightforward um, so we're going to crack on with it anyway I'm just going to move my chat window so I can see what you are up to. And then we're going to get cracking. Uh, one of the, the um, quirks, which is not entirely helpful, um, is that there are no handwritten um, instrument names in the left margin, apart from um, the odd few here and there. So for example, cor anglais, or English horn, is marked. Um, otherwise, everything else is under a pre-printed WW woodwind. Um, there's a pre-printed trumpets, brass, trombones, although um, I don't trust that. I think it's actually laid out horns above trumpets, and then therefore trumpets are not where they're marked. 
timps and cymbals written in and other percussion harp piano celeste harp and then glockenspiel is just above the string so it's kind of it's all over the shop <laughs> so not having the instrument names um, ascribed to each um, staff is uh, going to make things slightly challenging um, but we'll go as best as we can and there are lots of other fun things that I'll talk about as I come across them. Anyway, let's crack on. Uh, hi Victor, no, not missed much. And uh, hi Matty, good to see you as well. Let's go. Right. This score, incidentally, was um, almost entirely written twice <laughs> um, because um, quite late into the process um, Roland Emmerich decided that he wanted to change the way you know, that the audience felt about the Godzilla character and uh, you know so there was a sort of change in tone between it being a sense of awe and a sense of terror um, when you see the creature uh, and it's interesting there are several versions of the soundtrack that you can get hold of um, La La Land did a nice two disc edition which covered all of the the score that you hear in the picture uh, and then uh, by soundtracks um, BSX did a, a three disc ultimate edition which was the La La Land 2 disc plus the original um, promo disc um, which David produced and um, but neither of them actually um, contained all of the alternate cues so there's actually quite a lot of alternate cues which I'm not entirely sure were recorded um, but it would be quite interesting to do some sort of mock-up of them and see how they sounded. Um, right. assuming that this is on flute but uh, flute 3 is doubling on piccolo so that could potentially be pick um, it's not marked either way so we'll have to listen to the recording to see uh, for sure Starts on oboe one, goes to a two there, and then um, two takes over there. That should have been on voice two. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to put in a, a hidden uh, one at that point because Note Performer actually does a, a double, you know, two instrument sound um, and recognises it when you put a two. So I want it to go back to a single instrument sound at that point. We try not to get too bogged down with making this playback sound perfect. You know, we're not not going for a full-on mock-up sound but if we can quickly put a few things in that improve it then why not um, now uh, one of those quirks I mentioned earlier about um, Nick's uh, manuscripts 
that I came across during um, work on Independence Day. Luckily, we don't have in this situation in Independence Day, perhaps because of the density of um, the orchestration, um, the English horn and the oboes were on the same staff. Um, yet um, still transposing. So you had things that appeared to be written in fifths, which were actually sounding in octaves, uh, which is great fun. At least on this, they are on separate staves. So you hear that's in octaves, but it looks like it's in fifths. Imagine them being on the same staff and not being labeled in the left margin. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> hey Annie, <laughs> lovely to see you. And <laughs> hi Blake, happy lunchtime. It's a bit late for lunch me for me. Um Okay, so we got uh clarinet one. Hmm. That's interesting. No, I don't think that is that. Okie dokie. Right. So, uh, when we've got two voices, we should be having the slurs going away from the other part, really. Um, we start mezzo piano, crescendo. Right. Two, both in here. Okay, I see what's going on now. Right. Um. So normally, <laughs> film scores don't actually use key signatures, but yeah, this is, that's better. Right, so that should be natural, that should be natural, that's fine. Yeah, I understand what's going on now. All right. <clears throat> you know when you're putting notes in and they don't quite sound how you're expecting? Yeah, that was that. <laughs> um, six. I'll just put the rest of the woodwind in and then we'll play it back and see how it sounds. So we've got no um, no clarinet three in yet. Uh, another thing that's kind of tricky with the labeling on this or lack, lack thereof, um, I've luckily been able to get around because um, I have the orchestral breakdown for this as well. So I can actually tell you when this was recorded. I think it was April the 20th, 1998, I guess. If, if memory serves. Oops. So yeah, 10 ago. Um, Interesting. <laughs> That's not marked with a natural. 
um, but it would match in with the clarinet so I'm going to leave that for a second uh, doo -doo -doo, that's one given what else is marked below in the brass we'll keep that on forte so let's see if we've got any dodgy notes here on it um, yeah I don't know why they've done that they've put a key signature in and then decided to put sharps on the notes as well I can understand this one cancelling out the natural from the bar before or as a courtesy but yeah that should be uh, okay on the next pass okay brass um, Let's just have a quick listen to the beginning of the uh, original recording because I want to listen out for uh, which brass instrument is playing this because we'll be able to tell what order the score is laid out in then. Um, so we want this. That one. That's trumpet. transposition kind of gives it away as well the fact that that works um, I'm going to change oh I know I'm not no that's fine that works okay um, I was gonna say I need to change the horns over to a version that uses key signatures just to make sure I don't miss anything but there's no key signature in the horn part, which is good. So, um, like that. And okay, so that's horn one. And we want. Pretty nice to see um, six four not laid out as uh, I suppose it is. Yeah, it's laid out as two three, and then we go uh, three three two. Sorry, never mind. <laughs> Classic. Um, so that's horn three on that, and this is one and three still. That 
tend to hide shared rests. <clears throat> and then we want you on MP. Trombones. Got six trombones in this. I'm assuming that five and six are bass, but it's not marked as such. Um, if it sounds wrong later, I'll change that. So I'm going to put the uh, flat on there because uh, trombone one hasn't played the A flat yet. When you put it through onto parts, you should really have in your score that um, the accidentals follow each voice. So although you had the accidental here in trombone two previously, you still need it in the trombone one there. It's not the same as like when you're laying out um piano um, I might just do this just to put that in the specific place and then uh, we get trombone four joins in on that as well all right okay so the layout that I've got on this um, template is slightly different, slightly more sane than what's in <laughs> the manuscript. Um, so I'm going to need to keep splitting off trombone three and four, um, and when five and six appear, I'm not sure they may well be on the same staff as well. But on the manuscript full score, uh, at least four trombones are on the same staff. Um, so. Um, so let's do this quickly. Oops. the top notes and then uh, so here is where four comes in the dynamics aligned on the same vertical uh, sorry vertical horizontal plane <clears throat> nested slurs in the woodwind hmm let me know which bar you're referring to in the uh, airplane cube Blake and I'll have a look later on because I can't think of it off the top of my head. Uh, so, no. Oh yeah, that's that's another quirk. <laughs> imagine in the manuscript um, that all receiving notes of a tie if it was uh, changed by accidental in the previous bar they have the accidental and not the next note that comes along uh, 
is somewhat confusing. I sound like I'm being hypercritical. I apologise profusely if it has a, a meaning that I don't understand. But um, oh, I see. Right, actually, that is cheaper. I think I would know if there were names in this margin. <laughs> um, so we want Timp. Okay, um, these are marked with trills in the manuscript, but I'm going to do it with um, tremolo slashes. So you see, I'm kind of um, editorializing as I go to a certain extent. There's certainly um, more that I do after the fact, but um, right now um, we'll just try and follow the manuscript as closely as possible whilst making certain rational changes. Um, that, 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 no. So I guess that's actually Um, I use uh, diamonds and crosses for my uh, note heads on metals, so symbols, tam tam, that sort of thing. Um, just like that aesthetic. I started using though, instead of using the LV plugin, which is kind of a tough habit to break, but I'm now using a tie. Then if you go into the inspector, there's an LV mode that you can turn on. That looks quite nice actually. Um, so I'm trying that out for a bit. Um, then, uh, so we got a three foot tam, which is what are you doing? The same thing that needs that on it. Voice two. And then I'm going to hide the rests in the bass line because effectively our left hand. Not sure which way round they do it, but um, the lower hand is in the upper staff, so do that. Um, <clears throat> I guess alternatively, I could have put those notes down in the lower part and then used the the cross staff 
option but then as anyone who's a regular on this channel will know um, that sends Sibelius a bit loopy and uh, it really doesn't like it when you do things on the cross staff Oops, it's going to be actually in the piano um, and then octave higher in the celeste Still in range. Yep. Do that. <clears throat> so that's much higher. Excuse me, make my frog in my throat. Right. Um, hmm. Okay. Harp two. Going to set a pedal diagram. Uh, <clears throat> and we want A flat, B flat, E flat. So <clears throat> So using that LV again hopefully. Oops. Let's try that one more time. Oop, that's better. Close up to that. Um, there's no dynamic marked in that, so I'm going to put a uh, mezzo to, or maybe even a, yeah, that's a piano up to, um, 14. Excuse me. Actually, no, it's not right. If it's not across the state, that's fine. Um, okay, a bit of Glock. The Glockage bill is like <laughs> right near the bottom of the staff on this manuscript. It's not dotted, come on. Okie dokie, right. So then just adding in the strings, we'll go uh, to there.
license on the bearing there because there's nothing marked for the second pair of quavers. strange. In uh, the cello that is notated exactly as you see there, uh, dotted minim, minim crotchet or uh, <laughs> yeah, dotted half, half, quarter. <coughs> but in the bass part in the manuscript that half note is two tied quarter notes. <laughs> Inexplicably. Mm. Um, there we go. So let's listen to that first page. Um, now that we've got everything in, hopefully, fingers crossed, no squiffy notes. Sounds familiar. Uh, hi, Sentai Ranger Donnie. You've changed your username. Hi, Donnie. Um, hi, Marcel, and uh, V Core as well. Good to see you. Uh, no worries, Annie. I'll see you again soon, hopefully. I've got to finish off that uh, trifecta of studios. I was very privileged on uh, Thursday this week to spend a bit of time at uh, Air Studio in London. That recording session was really good. And ironically, saw David Arnold at the lunch table, but didn't have the nerve to go and talk to him. Uh, what's that marking then? I think a uh, two. That's fine. Um, we've got English horn basically doing the same.
we've got the same dynamics running through, so I'm going to copy that. Oops, that's not going to work, is it? Let's just do that. So everything's placed the same. Is so funny. <laughs> it's rather than writing a base clef to say bassoon's gone back to base clef, they've drawn an arrow to the pre printed base clef. Surely it would have been quicker just to do that. Never mind. Um, okay. Suppose it saves having double clefts. reading uh, which line was which because there's no names in the margin good that sounds a bit more like it Just one and three. Yep. So now we're um, one and two and three and three. Unlabeled horns then below <laughs> taking over that. Um. So for now, I'm not sure uh, which horns are playing that. Um, it might do a reminder on the next page and then I'll know. But 
and it's probably only one per part. Hi Friedman, Ernst. I'm guessing Ernst is your first name. How long will this be going? Um, I run for two hours usually, unless I decide I'm in the flow and nearly at the end of a queue and I keep going for a little bit longer. Um, so we've been going 50 minutes so far, it's just over an hour remaining. Um, let's see, so trumpets. to remember to split them out so that, that, that. So that there's either real grain on this manuscript or somebody keeps putting in errant dots because <laughs> stuff don't add up. So now with brass in, I'll just play that up to there. Label that. So it's 
him. Right. Uh, let's do left hand first. Just checking it all matches exactly, and uh, Celeste get that. Um, but they're still up the octave for the first bar of that. And then I think that's loco. Um, a gliss in harp two. Notice I'm jumping around because the layout of the um, original manuscript is somewhat different. So we're changing our diagram on this. And we're just having C sharp. Sure, what they're trying to do with the B in that. Um, that's MP up to MF. No LV marked on that. So I'll leave it off for now. Back to Glocker's bill. And let's do that up here. To label that clock instrument and just pop in the strings.
Tiff. So you think that slows over there, so I'm going to do oops that. our page two. Nice. Uh, Vaughn Vaughan, I don't have the reference material for Jupiter Ascending, so unless that does turn up, but I physically can't do that on the chain, I'm afraid. I know you've mentioned other um, Wachowski projects before. I think I do have reference material for Speed Racer, so um, could do that at some point. Um, but uh, you're out of luck, I'm afraid, at the moment with uh, Jupiter ascending. Okay, so what's going on here? Um, that's better. Interpreting going on here. <laughs> like, what am I actually seeing? Because um, the note head placement is a bit wonky. You can you can tell that it was done under extreme time pressure. Um, just by the speed of the handwriting. Yeah, the slant of it. And uh, quick slash note heads. Um, uh -huh. We have a 
first hint of marking for pick. So I think we were right to choose standard flute on flute three. Technically, if you're going to do trills um, on a part with uh, a score line with two parts, you should have two trill lines, um, especially perhaps if it's um, tails up and down. Here I'm sharing a stem, so I might be able to get away with just a single um, trill line. If you wanted to be super clear and say you know that one was say half a step and the other was a whole step trill, then you would certainly have to have two trill lines. If I'm reading this right, this is mezzo forte forte piano crescendo. <laughs> like this. M F F D. Which, of course, note performer will interpret as nonsense and just not do anything. Um, Mezzo fortissimo piano, I guess. <laughs> I think it should just be MFP. Why has it got FP on it? Everything else has got mezzo forte. So I'm just going to blend it with everything else. Do that. It's just nonsense otherwise. Um, then we've got piano. I think cause everything else has got trills marked. That's surely that's got to be trills as well. It's just been left off. Um, sense um bah, 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 bah. right oboes
maybe that's just a wiggly line in which case that's not a D sharp what else have we got in the rest of the score so this is a little tricky to read It's just a wiggly trill line. So um, we've got trill on there, trill on there. Something like that. I just realised um, something we haven't done is um, have a guess at what we might be doing next week. Um, I can tell you it's going to be an actor link. I see what you say, Vico, but it's so out of context of everything else that's in the score, I'm not so sure. Um, it's one of those that we'd have to review uh, when we're proofing. Some of this is going to clash a bit, I think, is what it's written in there. Or the orchestrator. Yeah, I could do if they ever spoke to me, but they've declined to reply to any of my messages.
really know if it's just become obscured. That is a forte. <clears throat> Then we've got a six duplet. Um, I'm guessing our two, it doesn't say. Still no sign of clarinet three yet. Curiously, that looks like this says bassoon two and three. Hmm. Um, oh, what is that? So, Contra hasn't played yet, so I'm going to hide that. I'm going to show Bassoon 3 like that. Do it this way. Um, There's kind of no nice place to put that. I might actually consider not showing a whole bar rest for voice one. It's not strictly necessary, it's just a kind of nice to have that I like to have there. Um, dynamics, we've got. Okay, so you do play like. Uh, two and three here. Yeah. Mezzo forte. You can see though how um, I was saying earlier about not doing the first cue because um, anything that requires a bit of thought about it takes a bit extra time and there's so much in this manuscript which is a bit out of the ordinary in terms of reading and interpretation 
just takes that much longer. Uh, to actually get through. Normally, you know, we know we sort of get through, I don't know, 10 pages or something in a, um, a two hour session. It kind of depends on how dense the orchestration is and how much I'm talking and not concentrating on what I'm doing. Um, but uh, pretty sure that's what I'm seeing. don't need to be in Teneclef for the lower voice but because it's on one staff in Teneclef I'm going to make sure that I'm not making a mistake in sub subsequent bars or anything I'm being in the wrong clef so we do that and then we'd editorialize later as necessary seeing there. That's a piano crescendo. sound like a total pig's ear. Let's see what we've got. No, in fact 
fact quite nice. Will you get off me now? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, come on guys, let's keep it civil, please. Um, Victor, it's not Danny Elfman's Mission Impossible, um, I'm afraid. That would be good though, wouldn't it? A Jean Reno link. In fact, yeah, that got me thinking. Um, yeah. It, this isn't what it is next week, but um, I'd quite like to have a quick chat with my friend Elia Smyrnal and um, Smurl, I should say, and um, uh, oh, I see that's what's that's going on, um, and see if I can get hold of um, some reference for Ronan, because I think that would be quite fun to maybe do the car chase scene. Um, but no, uh, not Mission Impossible, I'm afraid. tempted to have a look at score from Battlefield uh, is it Battlefield Earth? Yeah, Battlefield Earth as well. I know it's a shocking film, but um, it's quite a good score. Yeah, so we got three trumpets on the staff now, so I'm separating them out, so Or what's written in the score. There's an interesting little manuscript moment. Looks like it's a note from the uh, orchestrator to the copyists, but um, not quite sure what's, what it says.
Conte and back down. Piano up to uh, forty in that case. Back down. MP MF. Good. horns we've actually got five and seven playing now so maybe it was five and seven before where we didn't have anything marked let's keep it five and seven I think um, in which case that is that So piano up to that's a forte back down. There's a hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a mixture of fortes and mezzo fortes. Maybe that looks like some of them have been changed. So it's kind of difficult to tell on a black and white scan what is actually erased pencil that's been caught by the high contrast of a scan and what's actually just likely penciled in um, very tricky it's lovely when you get the chance to work from a high resolution colour scan that I've got for um, working on search for Spock later in the year are ridiculous. Two and a half gigabytes per page. Um. Ooh. Second guess. Hans Zimmer's The Simpsons movie. <laughs> No, it's not. But you've now got the spider pig theme going in my head. Uh, Lion King? No, unfortunately not. It's not a Zimmer score, actually. Yeah, <laughs> two and a half gig per page, yep. Yeah. 600 DPI TIFF files. Um, if you have the full page showing on the screen and I've got a you know, 24 inch monitor uh, the zoom level to show the full page is I think 1.6% zoom <laughs> if you go to 100% you can literally see the fingerprint in the graphite it's mad Okay, um, hmm. that looks like like there was a G minimum here that's been erased but then what does trombone 2 do? There are four notes and no, it's three. Okay, now I think I know what's going on now. <laughs> All this interpreting that has to go on. Right, that, like that. What we're going to do. Ba -ba -ba, ba -ba 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 -ba. 
mp up to f. I love actually when we have the different sections at um, different dynamic levels because when you shift those around there's a great bit I mean things like the end of um, ET um, where you have a held note but um, changes in dynamics between the two sections you know wind and strings that bring one out above the other um, and you get this you know change in the um, the flavor of the chord um, so I love that, that stuff is intentionally balanced with dynamics you know very deliberate they know exactly what sound they want to be prominent and what is background Any more guesses on the uh, what we're doing next week? play this back again in a sec when I've put the tuba in. i do that for dynamics. this good a little bit of temp Some suspended symbol.
things on there. down here somewhere. Um, that be mark tree, good. Keep it consistent. Alright, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do a non-linked line. Actually, no. I'm going to do a non-linked glyphs. Yes, I am going to do it with that line. See, so if I highlight the note, then do glyphs. Oh, I can grab that. It seems really contextual, and I haven't figured out what the context is, but you can't always grab that end anchor and move it um, if you haven't got a landing note. But I want to do that to kind of show the sweep upwards on that mark tree because you can go top to bottom and I want to go bottom to top like so okay um, and that's allowed to ring both times You're going to get sick to death of that. Oh my god, see that's gotten rid of my gliss lines now. Come on, Avid, sort your stuff out. Okay, so I'm going to have to do it with a, a line that is not attached to the note. I want it to be thin, so I'm setting it as a cue. We got there eventually, and da, 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 we have another sweep. Do we? Uh, yeah, it's chained line. <laughs> um, it's a longer, slower one now. So. which I don't want it to. Sorry, I'm muttering to myself <laughs> while I figure out what I'm doing here. That's fine. Uh, so we've got some triangle under this, um, which is that. Okay, it must be that line. Hmm, interesting. 
that must be the line I had the, bell, the mark tree on because the one below was marked bell tree I remember <clears throat> okay triangle Good, right, that's that job jobbed. Um, pretty sure, yeah, that's allowed to ring, that's done. Then we've got big harp sweeps. Goodness me, this is, see this score is so dense, it's taking a lot longer than we usually do um, to get through. And that's why. Um, actually, I'm going to change that and do that. Yeah. We've had some space saving done on this. All right, so that is not that. Yeah, probably will opt to do this this way. Um, MF up to forty. C sharps. Which is what we had our pedals were already set to just C sharp. Um, harp two is going to be set to F sharps only. This. So these have now become combined onto one staff. That's why I was like, yeah, what's going on here? Um, <laughs> like that. So when we're crossing over the staves, this is when I like to um, hide hands that would cross over. Um, Alright, I think I'm going to put the dynamics down here. And then we get this lovely screw up of the spacing. Thank you, Avid. I know that they're looking into um, quality of life fixes for grand staff writing, so I cannot wait for that to come in. So, so we are forty down to MF. Okay, 
So back to there. God, this is confusing. Doesn't say dim on that next one, so we'll see how we get on. Uh, right. soon enough <laughs> honestly um ba -ba -ba -bum. okay that and then one goes to do C to C with mezzo piano up to mezzo forte. Twilight Zone the movie? No. Do you have the original manuscript for that? So I could do that. Uh, War Games? No, but oh, yeah, love that movie. Um, I haven't said what the link was. It's an actor link. Um, Ready Player One? It's not. Uh, it has a yeah, Mechazilla um, cameo in it. It has an Iron Giant cameo in there as well, actually, which um, is quite fun. Um, but no, it is an Alan Silvestri score. So you've you've found the composer, but not the score. Uh, Dave, that's a good one. Yeah, it's not Dave. Looks a bit naffed, doesn't it? I think I might, I might put that back up there, you know. <laughs> How do we get that up there? Um, Okay, uh, piano di da da dum. Let's go. Set 
that's still not right. Why is that? Uh, right. <laughs> the beams on the uh, manuscript don't join up, so that looks like a crotch it. Fun times. Also, why do you put in a diminuendo on a note that you then can't do anything with except kind of fade out? <laughs> I'd be very tempted to editorialise that hairpin out and then just put a starting dynamic here of mezzo forte again. in America. as well. In fact we get that too. And then we whiz back up to our glockenspiel. Redundant hairpin there, really. Hmm. My stepmother is an alien. You never heard of that? It's not that. <laughs> Shame, you haven't heard that's such a good movie. <laughs> it's such a terrible movie. Uh, we've got a quick note here actually of a tempo change. I didn't spot it at the top of the page, it's down near the bottom. Um, it's only a slight moving on. Um, 2 BPM, so you're not really going to notice it. Volcano, Tommy Lee Jones. No, it's not, I'm afraid. Hi, Jacob, though. Sorry, I didn't say hello before. Didn't spot the new name in the chat. Oh, yeah, so 
Uh, at the top I mentioned these various um, unique quirks of uh, a Nick Dodd manuscript. Mm, that's interesting. There's a continuation marking. It's not continuing from anything on the previous page. That's fun. Maybe it's a hairpin that's been rubbed out. I think that's what it is. I'm going to put it back in. Um, so here is one. Um, <laughs> I kind of like it actually, but I've never seen it in anyone else's manuscripts. Yes. So this is Divisi. And instead of writing div, um, I can't do it on this, but he's literally written a mathematical division sign. You know, the like a tenuto with a dot above and below. <laughs> um I'm really surprised you guys are not getting this. Um, maybe I've made a mistake or something. I don't think I have. It's not mouse hunt. Sorry. just annoying. That's really annoying. <laughs> I thought it doesn't sound like it's in the right key. That's because it's not. And it's because the line that I thought was violin one is not violin one. Um, we've now added down the bottom of the score <laughs> um, two blue bells aka chimes. sound a lot nicer. <laughs> of Silvestri's film scores. <laughs> I 
No, I'm, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> Someone out there who's watching this off live is probably screaming at the screen. so ambiguous. Practical magic, it's not that either. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna quickly double check IMDB myself and make sure I'm not losing the plot. Which is Entirely possible. Godzilla, 1998. Do, 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 do. Cast. Yes. Actor, filmography. Do, do, do. Yeah. Okay. And okay, let's just double check. Composer of that <laughs> it is Alan Silvestri. Yeah, I'm not going mad. It's you lot. <laughs> So, yeah, this is definitely going to be the last page because I've just seen the time and we have overrun. But unfortunately, there's literally only 12 bars of work that we've managed to get in in two hours. That is absolutely mental. Partially because of the density of the orchestration, partially because of the um, legibility of the manuscript. And that is actually one of the reasons now, having learned my lesson the hard way, um, I insist 
on getting hold of the manuscript um, before pursuing a publishing project any further. Um, a, to check that it's all there, because often there are actually pages missing or um, whole queues missing sometimes. Um, or for some reason the, the archive will not release the, the manuscript. Come across that one before. Um, all sorts of things like that. Well, they won't respond to emails. <laughs> God. Um, but also to check legibility. Um, and anything that basically might become a kind of trap or a big time sink when working on it. Um, because, you know, if you can do another project or two projects in the time that it would take you to do one tricky one, it makes it a bit more of a, a tricky prospect in terms of commercial viability. Depends what it is. Yeah, you know, if you were saying, oh, it's going to be a bit of a struggle, but it's Star Wars or something, <laughs> that's a bit different than if you're considering, I don't know, Fast and Furious 23 or whatever it is up to at the moment. Quick and the Dead. It's not the Quick and the Dead. Michael's got it. There we are. Night at the Museum 2. That's the one. That's what we're going to do. And we got there just in time before the end of the episode. Well done, Michael. Let's have a quick listen to this page. Um, and then we'll listen to all of the four pages we've done so far. <laughs> and there we are. I think there might be some uh, whole note, half note, trill issues in this um, which might be why that sounded a little bit wonky it's just it was this part that sounded a bit squiffy that would do it Okay, let's listen to those pages and then I'll export it to a PDF and play the whole queue out um, as we leave. shame that there's so little of it but it's lovely um, it's lovely kind of sweet at the end of the movie um, but it never really goes into the super heavy stuff um, 
that you get at the beginning of the movie. It's more of a slightly uh, triumphant end. Lovely. Okay, let's export that to a PDF. Um, and we'll bring that up and uh, play out with the original audio. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this one, even though uh, we didn't get through a huge amount of music. Um, next week, as I said, we'll be having a look at Alan Silvestri's score from Night at the Museum 2, Battle of the Smithsonian. Uh, we are linking via actor Hank Azaria, as Michael correctly pointed out. And uh, I ho hope you'll join me for that one. If you've enjoyed this, then please throw a thumbs up on the video because it helps spread it to other people who might not have discovered the channel before. And if you have enjoyed this, consider subscribing and you'll get notified every time I put up live streams as well as other completed videos from the chain and other things that we've got going on. Anyway, hope you have a good week and I'll see you again next time. Ciao for now.